So you just got a homebrew kit for the holidays or maybe a birthday. Now what? Well, you came to the right place because I'll show you everything you need to know about how to start brewing with that kit, what you'll need beyond the kit, and how you can keep using it long after one brew day to make amazing beer over and over again. I'm Trent Musho and this is The Brew Show. Let's brew our first kit. Beer is actually a pretty magical thing when you think about it. The fact that you can gift or receive a gift of a homebrew kit means you can have the power to make magic in your home. And on the outset, it certainly looks a lot like alchemy, but I promise it's not that hard to make excellent beer at home. But there are a few things you'll need to understand about the process, potentially a few things that might be worth picking up to make your life easier, and I'll even show you some shortcuts to simplify the process even more. If you've never brewed before and are feeling completely lost, don't worry, I get a video on the basics of how to brew and explains the entire process as well as some keywords that I might drop in this video. So to start, let's take a look at what might come in an average kit. Most importantly, there's a kettle. This is basically a big pot that we'll use on the brew day to steep grains, dissolve extract, and boil it. If your kit doesn't have one, then any kitchen pot can work as long as it's big enough. Five gallons is a nice size for smaller batches of beer, but 10 gallon pots are best for five gallon batches, which is the average size of most homebrew recipes. You're gonna need a way to heat this kettle up a kitchen stove will work fine, but if you have some outdoor burner like this, it's ideal. That way, when you inevitably make a mess, you won't be cleaning up the stove for hours on hours while your roommate or significant other stares at you from across the room. Take it from experience. Next up is a fermenter of some kind. Typically, starter kits have buckets like these, which work perfect. Bonus points if they have a spigot for easy transfers. And usually they'll have some kind of airlock hole in the top. Speaking of airlock, this is a little device that lets CO2 escape during fermentation, but lets nothing in. This prevents any bacteria or bugs from getting into your beer and helps minimize oxidation, which is where air touches your finished beer and makes it taste stale or bad. Some other helpful tools that might be included are a spoon for mixing, a siphon for transferring beer around, a brush for cleaning, and a bottle capper and caps for when you're ready to package the finished beer. Bonus points to this kit for including a bottling wand. Not needed, but it'll certainly be helpful later. Kits will also include this packet of cleaner slash sanitizer, which is vital. All tools and equipment must be sanitized after the boil through the bottling process to limit infections. But if you see yourself brewing beyond today, then go ahead and just pick up some star sand. This is the standard sanitizer for brewing and a small bottle will last you many, many brews. That's technically all you need to get started equipment wise. But there are a few things I'll suggest you get to help you out. First is a spray bottle. Whether you just use that little sanitizer packet or you buy some star sand, making a solution with water and putting in a bottle will make sanitizing a breeze. You can just quickly spritz anything down and move on. The second is some way to calculate sugar content or specific gravity. A hydrometer or refractometer would work great. These help you track the specific gravity so you can have an idea of what the alcohol content could be. Some kits might even come with this already. And lastly, you'll need a thermometer. This is an infrared one, but any average thermometer can work. It's important to monitor temps during the brew day as well as once fermentation has started. Now let's look at what the ingredients might look like in your kit. This kit here is a partial mash IPA. So yours might look a little different, but all recipes will include hops, which give bitterness, flavor, and aroma to the beer, some form of malt extract. This will either come in liquid or dry form, and this is what provides the main fermentable sugars of your beer. And then yeast. This is what converts those sugars into alcohol and CO2, making beer. As mentioned, this is a partial mash kit. So that means it has some extra crushed grains that you can steep or mash with to infuse for more complex flavors. The grains come pre-crushed, and the kit should include a cloth bag to put them in for steeping and easy cleanup. Oh, and your kit will also have some corn sugar. This is for the bottling process. And you'll add this sugar to your finished beer to carbonate. The main thing missing from this ingredient list is water, which is pretty important. I highly recommend using store-bought water or reverse osmosis water. Tap water can have some chemicals in it that can mess with the flavors unless treated properly. And distilled water is lacking a lot of key minerals needed for brewing good beer. Water chemistry can be kind of complex, so let's just keep it simple. That should be it. Now let's run through the general process to give you an idea of what it takes to make beer. First, add the water to your kettle. This kit is actually making a concentrated wort and then diluting it with cold water after the boil. But if you have a giant kettle, then you can add it all in now. Raise the temp up to a boil. If you have a partial mash kit like this, it might tell you to add the sack of grains now and give specific mash temps. And that does matter. So if it says to, let's say, mash at 152 Fahrenheit for 20 minutes, then do that. This one says to just raise the temp and add the sack of grains until you hit 170 degrees at which point you remove the grains and bring to a boil. And if you got some heat proof gloves, you can try squeezing the bag to get a little bit extra out of it, but not necessary. Once it'll boil, turn off the heat and add the malt extracts. Turning off the heat is a huge detail because this stuff will sink to the bottom and scorch if the burner is on. 
So take the time to turn it off and slowly mix in the extract. It might take a while. And use the hot water to loosen up that liquid extract. Once dissolved, bring it to a boil. Your recipe will tell you for how long to boil, but usually it's about 60 minutes. So set a timer. Now keep that spray bottle handy, because as soon as the sugary wort comes to a roll, it has the tendency to boil over. So spray it down with water, or even sanitizer is fine, until the foam stops and it falls back to a normal boil. This is called the hot break, and it's completely normal. But I'm just trying to help you from making a mess. Now it's time to add the hops. It all depends on your recipe. It'll tell you at what minute mark and how much to add. This is where it really starts to smell good. And once the last hop is in, and the boil timer is up, it's time to cool the wort down. Brew day is just about done. It's best to chill down fast. That way you can minimize any chance for a potential infection to occur. So the simplest method is to fill your sink with cold water and ice and put the kettle in there. Occasionally stirring the wort with a sanitized spoon and being careful not to splash in any water from your sink. You're looking to get this as close to 70 degrees Fahrenheit as possible. If you have a recipe that's condensed, then you're lucky because you can dilute this with cold water to get the temps down fast. Once you reach 70 degrees, you can transfer into the fermenter. Make sure the fermenter is clean and has been fully sanitized. This kit was concentrated, so we added cold water up to where the recipe said, which was the five gallon mark. With the wort in, the last step is to add the yeast, then add the sanitized lid on top. Give the bucket a good shake for 30 seconds to incorporate oxygen. It'll help the yeast out at the start. Then add the airlock that's been filled with some sanitizer, and boom, brew day is officially done and beer is on its way. Set this fermenter in a cool place around 68 degrees Fahrenheit for a week. Ideally, you don't want the temps to exceed 70 degrees Fahrenheit, but this depends on the yeast. There are some yeast that can handle warmer temps, so check your recipe. And from this point on, don't open the fermenter again until bottling day. You want to limit oxygen exposure to preserve the flavor as much as possible. This kit actually has a dry hop addition, which is where you add more hops after fermentation starts. I suggest adding them while fermentation is still active, maybe day two or three. Just quickly open the lid, toss them in, and close fast. You'll know fermentation is happening when you see that little airlock bubbling. And by about a week later, it'll slow down and eventually stop. If you have a hydrometer, you can take readings before and after fermentation to have a more precise idea of whether or not your beer is done fermenting. Two to three days of consistent readings once bubbling has stopped is generally a good sign it's ready. So now it's time to bottle the beer up. If you're brewing a five gallon batch like this, that means about 50 bottles. So hopefully you've been saving them up or asking friends for help in exchange for some fresh homebrew. Clean and sanitize every single bottle, grab your caps and capper, and get the corn sugar. There's two ways to go about this. First is to use a bottling bucket and put all the priming sugar in and then transfer the beer on top, mixing the sugar evenly and then filling up the bottles from that bucket. But that can risk a lot of oxidation and potentially ruin your beer. So I usually prefer to ferment in the bottling bucket, which is the one with the spigot, and then portion out the sugar individually into each bottle. Granted, this is a lot more tedious, but it will minimize oxygen exposure meaning a better tasting product. But it's up to you which one you would prefer. Both work, as long as you're careful. Oh, and if you have this bottling wand, cut a small piece of tubing and add it to your spigot. The bottling wand is spring activated and only lets liquid through once you push the bottle all the way up. It'll make things a lot faster and a lot cleaner. Once the bottles are filled up and primed, place the sanitized cap onto the magnetic part of the capper and crimp it down. Definitely get a friend to help out on bottling day. It makes it a million times easier. And if this is your least favorite part about the process, you can always upgrade to a keg system later on, making packaging and carbonating an absolute breeze. With the bottles all filled, you just need to set them somewhere cool, probably wherever you had your fermenter at, for up to two weeks to build up carbonation. The yeast left in the beer will re-ferment that corn sugar, creating CO2, aka bubbles in the beer. And if you're patient enough and hold out the urge to crack one open too early, in just about 14 days or so, you can be sipping on your own delicious homebrew. Hopefully it was an absolute success. If not, I have a ton of videos on mistakes and how to fix them. But if it did go well, then you might be asking yourself, what next? Well, the easiest thing to do from here is grab a refill recipe kit, which supplies you with a pre-made recipe that has malt extract, hops, and yeast. That way you can reuse all your equipment, but try something new to brew. And just keep brewing and practicing. Eventually you can upgrade to brew all grain where you can really unlock some amazing flavors and recipe potential. But don't ever feel overwhelmed. Sure, there's lots of things to learn, but now you're part of a special club, and there's a lot of great people here that can help you along the way. I'll leave one more tip, and that's to check out this video of the three easiest homebrew recipes for beginners. Cheers, and happy brewing.